My Expat Taxes is the most trusted software for U.S. expats. Filing from abroad can be complicated, but My Expat Taxes makes it simple with their award winning software. E file instantly and chat with U.S. expat tax specialists. No tax situation is too complicated. Welcome to Global Take, presented by School Rubric, a show about the international teaching experience. Teaching internationally is one of the best decisions you can make as an educator. In this show, we will meet teachers and administrators from around the globe, living and working internationally. Our hope is that their stories and experiences will inspire you to explore the world of education. We will learn about all aspects of international teaching, from becoming an international teacher, to what countries are the best fit for you, to the challenges of being away from your home country. Come take this unforgettable journey to the world of international schools with Global Take, presented by School Rubric. All right, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. I want to welcome you to the summer episode of Global Take. My name is Wallace King, and I'm part of the School Rubric team. And this is a show connecting educators from all around the world. Today, we're going to be talking about connecting education after the pandemic. It's been a year like no other. A lot of folks are on summer vacation. So whether you are watching this live or whether you are watching this recorded after the fact, we hope that this show and the conversation that's happening today is gonna to provide some ideas and help stimulate some conversation as we look to prepare for the next school year and think about what we can do different, what we can do better in service to our students. It's my honor and privilege today to facilitate today's conversation. We have three outstanding educators from literally all over the world. And I'd like to introduce them and like them to talk a little bit more about themselves. But we have with us today, Dr. Christopher Nagy, who's the superintendent of schools at Burlington County Institute of Technology in New Jersey. We also have Alan Cameron, who's a teacher and education specialist at Soundtrap in Scotland. And then we also have Dr. Emily Watson, who is a lecturer and head of music education at the University of Melbourne in Australia. So we literally have educators from all over the world. We'd love for you to talk a little bit more about your work and make some introductions. Uh, Dr. Watson, we'd love to start with you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you all tonight. It's, a, it's really exciting and, and really fantastic to connect with educators from all over the world. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm speaking to, to you from, the Boonarong people of the Kulin Nations, and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. So I'm a music education lecturer and the head of music education at the Melbourne Graduate School of Education at the University of Melbourne. Um, my role is primarily working as a teacher educator and I work with teachers in training across early childhood settings as well as primary schools and secondary schools. Um, so I have over 20 years of experience as a music educator. As a high school teacher, I taught classroom and instrumental music at primary schools and secondary schools in Australia and the UK, including as head of department at secondary schools in the UK for quite a number of years. Um, so out, throughout 2020 and 21, I've done lots of workshops in schools with young people, mostly in person, COVID restrictions, restrictions permitting. And so part of my role has also been working with our teachers in training and supporting them on placement. So I spent quite a lot of time in schools working with them and working with their mentor teachers. Um, and so this has been really helpful for getting in touch with what's going on in schools in the moment. And those conversations that are coming out of those experiences are really interesting and are also giving us lots of pointers to where we might go in the future after the pandemic. Excellent. Well, we appreciate you sharing your experience and bringing that wealth of experience to today's conversation. Uh, Dr. Nagy, I'd like to pass it over to you. Thank you, Wallace. Um, I'm a superintendent of schools for the Burlington County Institute of Technology and Burlington County Special Services School Districts here in New Jersey in the United States. Uh, we have over a thousand employees. Um, I bring over 30 years of experience in education uh, to this particular role. 
Um, during this particular time, you know, we have post-secondary, we have secondary and pre-K through uh, age 21 special needs students. Uh, so we, we, we service a number of different students and we focus on a career technical education uh, with over 33 different career technical education programs. Um, I would like to uh, just put out a quick shout out to all of the teachers and all the educators around the world, uh, especially during this particular time. Um, certainly, I understand what it means to be a teacher. Uh, I know what it means to, to uh, support over a thousand staff members in my districts. And um, I just want to thank them very, very much because they did the unimaginable. Um, they migrated through the disruption and the hybrid environment. Uh, they had to balance family life and work, and they had to pivot, and many times without the resources to move through hybrid, virtual, and in-person learning. So uh, we hope that this show uh, globally addresses a number of those concerns, but we could not have done it without our teachers. Absolutely well said, and definitely want to shout out all the teachers for all the hard work that they put in this last year, and just on a regular basis, right? I mean, the work that they do with their students, um, and, and everything. They definitely have a well-deserved summer, but we're really looking forward to a, a, an excellent school year next year. And again, hope this, this conversation will help guide and inform to some degree. Alan, love to pass it over to you, who is across the pond in Scotland. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Thank you, Wallace. Yes, I, <clears throat> it's good to share with everyone today. My name is Alan Cameron, and I've been a school music teacher for over 20 years working in schools in the Glasgow area in Scotland. I've also been an education administrator with a couple of local authorities, one in a city in Glasgow, and one in a rural area in the southwest of Scotland. And I changed direction in 2016 to work part time with Soundtrap for Education, which is an online audio recording studio, which allows young people to be creative and collaborative in podcasting and making music. I still work as a supply classroom teacher, and I was working with classes in Lockerbie Academy as recently as two weeks ago. I've also had the good fortune to have visited schools in the USA and Australia, and I often reflect on the similarities and differences in education systems, and I look forward to today's conversation. Awesome. Thank you, Alan. I got to say, I, I checked out Soundtrap. I did not know about it before this episode, and as I was preparing for it, checked it out and really appreciated you know, some of that creative, creative stuff going on, and, and really great to hear that you're also in the classroom working yeah. with students throughout this and, and bringing that experience as well. Um, not just in Scotland, but in the US and, and Australia, as you had mentioned. Yeah. So with all that said, we have five prompts today that we'd like to guide through and have a conversation about. They're very forward looking. And again, hopefully that they will stimulate some thought and some dialogue. <laughs> um, so really, I would like to invite our panelists to challenge each other, to have a robust conversation, to have a robust dialogue as we discuss some of these reflective prompts. So we'd like to jump in the first one, which is talking about where the pandemic will go. Um, or where education will go after the pandemic. Will education go back to where it was before the pandemic across the globe? We want to know. So I know this is a fairly broad question. We talk a lot about the new normal. We talk about return to normal, return to campus. I'd like to start off with you, Chris, in terms of what you're doing and what you think about this question. Well, first and foremost, will education go back to where it was? Uh, the answer is no, it can't and it shouldn't based upon what it is that we learned uh, during the pandemic. Um, there are uh, a, a number of areas <clears throat> where uh, this is true. And first and foremost, it has to do with uh, mental health and well-being. Another is empathy and human connection. Uh, there's a creativity crisis, and Seth Godin, the number one business blogger in the world, basically said, now this is an opportunity for us to demonstrate what it is that we've learned and how we're going to change what the future looks like. Um, it's an equity and access issue currently right now across the globe. Um, there are some that do not have uh, all the tools that they need in order to uh, to, to, to migrate through this, uh, this environment, a hybrid, in-person, the technology, access to technology, access to um, the, the, the appropriate uh, uh, 
uh, bandwidth in order to uh, appreciate online learning. Um, in addition to that, um, if we take a look at the quality of learning, you know, uh, we have a, a digital divide, the support, the recovery associated with uh, what it is that uh, potentially was uh, missed uh, in, this, in this type of environment. Uh, the training of teachers, and we'll hear more about that from, from Emily. The vulnerable student populations, and uh, this is truly impacted, especially uh, special needs uh, students and uh, so many different ways. And uh, taking a look at growth versus a closed mindset as we take a look at, you know, are we going to be different? It's interesting. I was taking a look at uh, Think Again, which is the latest book by Adam Grant, who's an uh, organizational psychologist at Harvard's uh, Wharton School of Business. And you know, he basically said, we like to hold on to our uh, old viewpoints. Uh, in essence, we many times say, are we going to be going back to the pre-pandemic uh, time? And then the reason being is many of us, we like to be in that area of comfortable, comfortableness, if you will. Uh, we, where we don't necessarily have to work that hard. In other words, we're thinking short term, we're thinking of the now, we're thinking of the quick fixes. And so we need to start thinking about that post-pandemic. Post we need to be, challenge ourselves to rethink, you know, what is it that we're currently doing right now? What is it that we learned during this pandemic? And how is that going to change? And how are we going to build upon what we've learned and implement that in the future? And then, you know, what are the... Uh, uh, what are our viewpoints versus other viewpoints? Uh, do we like being in a silo with like people and we do not want to challenge ourselves, our assumptions? And I think this is, this is what's taking place during, uh, during the pandemic and as we take a look at the, uh, the post-pandemic. Uh, we don't like being in the uncomfortable mode. Uh, we prefer to be among those who have similar viewpoints. Yet, we many times say we have an open mindset. And the question is, do we? And um, that's the question that we need to answer as we take a look at the future. Is that going to, are we going back to the way it was? We can't. We've learned too much during this pandemic. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great, that's a great opening. Dr. Nagy, really appreciate that. And I got to say, I have a child who's a kindergartner or was a kindergartner this last year, and he did it all virtually. And I can say that, boy, there were some really great things about learning virtually. And I, have, I also acknowledge the privilege that I have to be able to have him in virtual school and to support him. My parents also spend a significant amount of time here with me in order to support him as well while I had to work virtually. And then he's going back to physical school next year. And so when you know we talk about this question, I'm just like, no, please not, right? Let's merge the best of both worlds. And so with that said, you know, I want to pass it over to, to Dr. Dr. Um, Dr. Wilson. Tell us a little bit about your responses and your reaction to what Dr. Nagy is say, saying. Absolutely. And I think that there's sort of more commonalities and there are differences between the quite different contexts. In Australia, we've had a lot less impact from the pandemic compared to other places like America and like the UK. However, we've still had schools in remote learning for a long time. So the schools probably spent six months of last year and certainly are children who were starting school spent most of last year um, learning remotely. And that was really challenging for their parents and also for their teachers, but they certainly learned some things for that. Um, for us at the university is we have been mostly online for well over a year now, and that's definitely become um, our new normal that I think will keep going forward. One thing I'd pick up is about the use of digital technology. So that's something that teachers have been grappling with um, for a long time. Some are more comfortable than others with that. But I think this shift to remote learning has really moved that along and everybody's had to get comfortable with it very quickly, whether that was um, something they wanted to do or not. And so I think that the possibilities that digital technologies have opened up for teachers and for students, is that something that we can take forward? There's certainly challenges with that. And you've spoken about the equity issues. And I think we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, they're definitely there. But I think the and I liked Chris's comment about creativity and the creativity crisis is really digital technologies offer some excellent possibilities for um, being more creative in what we do with our teaching and how we work with our students. Right. You know, I'm wondering, Alan, as we kind of close out this first question, is this really a dichotomy? Is it back to normal or virtual slash remote? 
or is there a gray area where we can kind of take the best of both worlds and forge this way ahead? And then also kind of thinking about the existing organizations in place that some, in, some fo in some cases, folks there don't know anything better but to go back to the way things were. Alan, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I agree with Chris and Emily, and I think there's now an opportunity to look at what education systems might look like further down the road. So if we try to do return to things, only to the things we did pre-COVID, I would suggest, like Chris has said, I, I would suggest we're doing our children and young people a disservice. Um, I think we can now build on what we've learned in lockdown and that young people's education can actually be much more than it was pre-lockdown. So we're not going to just slip back to the old normal, as Emily is saying. There's, a, there's also a danger inherent in the fact that some educators still need to be convinced that the quality with online learning can be really great. Um, just to give one example, I believe there's now wider acceptance of online working and young people can now present themselves, for example, for assessment and exams at a place and time of their choosing. That could be a new, a new development. So I agree with everything that's been said. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I remember a long time ago talking about higher education when I would speak to colleagues about folks who are doing their master's degree or university studies, you know, as recently as 10 or 15 years ago, it was kind of a, a stigma associated, well, you're doing it online? Is that, is that real? Is that the same? Is, do you, do you, do you, is your diploma any different? Do you have a special, a special designation on your diploma? And I think nowadays, it's one of those things where I'm studying online. Oh, okay. There's nothing different about it, or there's nothing perceived that's inherently different about the quality of the education. And I feel like, obviously, for K-12, uh, for primary and secondary education, then, of course, then this is the beginning of that, because we were never at scale with regard to digital implementation and digital tools and remote learning in that sphere. Let's move on to question number two, um, talking a little bit about education recovery and filling that learning gap post-pandemic. How can schools, education authorities, and governments support education recovery effectively and equitably? Dalin, I want to jump back to you on this one because I know you have experience as both a teacher during these times, working with students directly, but also as an educational administrator. So I'm, I'm assuming, presuming that you're able to see it from the policy perspective as well. Tell us a little bit about your thoughts. Yeah, thanks Wallace. Yes, well, for schools, for education authorities and for governments to support education recover, recovery effectively and equitably, it depends on reliable data, on some good details and then some very deliberate actions. Now, we know in March 2020, the decision was taken to close school buildings for the majority of learners in the UK as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. But early evidence provided an indication that the impact of this was disproportionately felt by those living in socio-economic deprivation. Now, in the north part of the UK, here in Scotland, where I live, the Scottish Government commissioned an equity audit to find out more about this impact and the mitigations that were put in place and the equity audit reviewed national and international literature and gathered interview data. Now, in supporting education recovery effectively and equitably, the following areas were identified. So there's five. There was health and wellbeing support. There was digital infrastructure and connectivity. There was support for parents and families. There was support for teaching provision and the quality of learning. And then there was a specific supporting recovery in 2021 plan. Now, Education Scotland, which is the education wing of the Scottish government, if you like, this year is continuing to widen access for all learners via what they call the National Learning Offer, which provides live, recorded and supported learning resources for learners at all levels. And we have a national DigiLearn team, and they provide a range of strategies, tools and guidance to support learning and teaching remotely. And activities have been developed to help families and practitioners support learning at home during the recovery period. Support continues to be offered by local teams who are working with individual schools, clusters, local authorities to ensure the most effective experience for learners. And finally, in this, schools and local authorities have to follow or should follow the Scottish Government's lead in this by looking closely at their own local data 
and take appropriate and quick actions to ensure effective recovery and equity. Alan, there's a lot that you said there. One of the things that really resonated with me was looking at data, right? Because yeah. we need to look, you know, we, you know, that's one of the one of the challenges in education globally is looking at data, tracking data, and using data to make decisions. So I really want to turn over to, to, to you, Chris, in terms of asking what kind of data are you looking at? Or are you going to have your teachers look at as this new school year begins to assess where students are and to help make some instructional decisions? Yeah, that, that's an important question, Wallace. Uh, our, our staff took a look at uh, what it is, the, the basic metrics. So you, you basically have, are the students getting it? If they're not getting it, what is it that we're providing them to support them? Uh, so you not only have uh, grades and uh, tests, but you also have the ability to look at uh, online. Uh, you know, how are the students engaged? Um, what type of group work are they doing? What is the level of uh, participation? Um, then at the same time, you know, we, we've run into this, and I know many of my colleagues have in the United States, where there are a number of students who did not want to, um, uh, to, to be on camera. And that's an equitable issue for various reasons. It might be uh, the home situation. It might be um, what it is uh, that, they, that, that they're wearing. So in terms of the metrics, we're looking at not only uh, testing, but we're also looking at observable um, uh, focus areas by the teachers. And then we also had all of our staff um, and, and our, our guidance counselors and other support staff that were there uh, to hold office hours and to uh, meet with our students and to collect uh, additional information and then to provide the appropriate resources to those students. Um, we also had uh, educational uh, coaches and we had teachers assisting other teachers in order to migrate through this so that we could provide the very best uh, education in that particular environment. Emily, I want to just maybe close out this question by flipping the script a little bit. I know we talk a lot about students who've been struggling, equity issues. Obviously, it's very, very important. We want to make sure that we're meeting all students where they are. But part of meeting students, all students where they are is also acknowledging that through the pandemic, some students have actually been quite accelerated. Some students have actually thrived under this circumstance. So what kind of advice or thoughts do you have for teachers and teachers in schools meeting the needs students who say, this year has been great for me. I've learned a ton. I enjoy virtual schooling. I enjoy this new format. I think it's about providing options and it's about providing a balance. So it's, it, again, it's not a dichotomy. It's not one or the other, but it, there certainly are students who've really thrived in that isolated experience and they would prefer to stay there. So um, whether that's a good thing in the longer term, I think is open for discussion, but definitely providing opportunities for that and that and it comes back to student choice, that students are able to exercise some choice. And I know we talk a lot about um, students need more voice in their learning and finding ways to provide that and actually teachers and schools and systems being responsive to student choice and recognising that they do have a voice and they do have agency and what can we do to support that rather than just sort of going back to, well, this is how we've always done it and you need to conform to the system and maybe we can think about how we do things a little bit differently. Right. You know, I've heard some great things there. I heard go where the research is, go where the data is. I've heard about great student support and offering office hours. And I've also heard about student choice, right? And so those are some really interesting and important pillars, I feel like, as we look to support students this new school year. Before we move on to the next question, I'd like to throw a couple of things just really quickly. We have a couple of publications that I'd really love to just highlight. Uh, as a lot of folks know, School Rubric is a nonprofit organization. So we really, we're doing this out of the love of education, for the love of discussion, for the love of dialogue, for the love of sharing stories. So one of the publications that we have is Interact Magazine. It's a magazine with stories from educators all over the world. It's a digital magazine. You can check it out at schoolrubric.com. We have a new edition and a new issue coming out next week. And then I'd also like to invite you to check out Global Education Insights. Global Education Insights, whereas Interact Magazine, we have eight stories, six to eight stories, diverse from educators all over the world on different topics. Global Education Insights, 
is a magazine where we have one question and we ask educators from all over the world to respond to the same question. And then the idea is that we're able to really see the difference in thought, opinion, perspective. So I'd really like to invite folks to check that out at schoolrubric.com. Emily, Alan, Chris, I'd like to invite you to contribute um, an article or a perspective in one of our future issues. Let's move on to question number three, talking a little bit about mental health and support issues a little bit more in depth. What are the mental health and well-being support issues needing to be addressed for students and families following the pandemic based on what was experienced during the pandemic? So, Chris, I know you dug into this. You talked a little bit about this in the first two questions, but let's go a little bit deeper. Talk to us a little bit more. Let's peel back that onion. Um, thank you, Wallace. Uh, first and foremost, I, I think there, there are four prongs to, to look at this. One is uh, taking a look at building safety and in inclusive environments where students feel like um, they, 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 can, uh, they can be in a position where they can thrive and be supported. Um, and then supporting the social and emotional needs, not only the staff, the students, but we have found a significant need to also help our families. Um, and that's just firsthand. And I'll comment momentarily about that. And then um, the support of mental health, again, staff, students, and families. We're taking, um, in the United States right now, the government has provided, the federal government as well as states, have provided funds to school districts to create programs for mental health support, not only for the students, but for the staff and for families. And then last but not least, support of the subgroups. We have vulnerable student populations and uh, significant uh, efforts need to be there to support them and to give them that extended learning and the, the, the social and emotional supports in order for them to thrive in the in the classroom, you know it's interesting. Um, you know, we've heard during this pandemic that it's the United States of anxiety, uh, and, and you know, in an article I read in January 2021, 40 percent of adults are reporting experiences of symptoms of depression and anxiety. That's three times more than in 2019. Why is that important? Because if the parents are anxious or depressed at home that is a direct link to the students themselves. And so it creates that family type of situation that then is brought into the school. Um, in addition to that, 46% of parents reported new or worsening mental health conditions in their child since the pandemic. Or 29% of the parents um, said that they've taken them to the emergency rooms, their, their children, uh, for mental health uh, for, their, for, their, for their child. And we're seeing an uptick in suicidal ideations and mental health related emergencies, uh, which are on the rise. So in essence, what this is basically uh, saying to us is this has to be a priority. We need to put our resources to this. And going back to that first question, um, is this, you know, are we going back to where we work? We can't, we, we don't have that ability to do that because this pandemic has truly affected the mental health and well-being, the social and emotional uh, balance, if you will, of our educational systems. And, you know, going back to um, what I mentioned before, um, and, and that is, you know, it, it truly does take a village when we're addressing not only our students, but our families. And it, it, is, a, um, it, it is an opportunity for us. We don't know what we don't know as we take a look at the impact that this will have. And I think this will be with us for a number of years to come. And so I, and I know this is not just something germane to the United States. This is across the world. And I, I welcome uh, my colleagues to, uh, to also comment on that. Yeah, open it up. Emily, I see you unmuting yourself talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm glad that Chris spoke about the impact on students and families, and I'm really seeing the impact on teachers in schools. And so I'm really pleased that Chris started with a big thank you to them, and I would echo that. And I think the workload for them has been overwhelming. The, 
chronic stress that they're now dealing with for well over a year, you can really see it starting to catch up and the amount of support that they're providing to the students in their care and then to the families as well, that's something that is ongoing, but that's also taking quite a lot from them. So I think we've really got to find ways at supporting teacher wellbeing um, and building their capacity to support the students and the families that they're working with. And I know that in Australia that we've had issues of teacher shortages that predate the pandemic. And this is now something that sort of wellbeing is intersecting with that. And it's something that as a system that we're going to have to look at going forwards. But I think the t it's just the tip of the iceberg with the wellbeing challenges at the moment. And it really is a really long term thing that we're going to be grappling with, um, which is going to place a lot of pressure on systems and schools and on families and on students themselves. So I think it, it really is the big challenge going forwards. Alan, any thoughts? Well, I, I heard a, an amazing story on the radio this week uh, of a head teacher, Zane Powell's. Uh, he's in Grimsby, England, and he was delivering meals to families in the area of social and economic deprivation he finds his school in. Um, he stated that the children were entitled to free school meals. So the right thing to do was, because, because they couldn't get it in school, as far as he was concerned, I've got to get those meals out to them. So even in his role as a teacher, he said that, as a teacher, his main role is to educate young people. However, safeguarding and care for children are also very, very important. And he, he and his teaching team made packed lunches for the kids in the mornings. They took them out to the families, got, got an opportunity to check on how families were doing, check on their mental health issues, how they were doing uh, directly. Now, half of the families he deals with don't have Wi-Fi, never mind IT devices. And during the third lockdown, he was sourcing laptops from the local authority and from local businesses, getting dongles to provide an internet connection. And, and he said that some of his families couldn't even afford gas and electricity, never mind Wi-Fi costs. Now, in his role as head teacher, he, he really made a clear statement that the role of schools now includes the care and welfare of families. You know, you know, if I can yeah, right. swing back to this, um, I, I think one of the things too that we're doing to support uh, our staff are introducing uh, the principles of applied positive psychology and uh, also mindfulness, uh, yoga, um, other types of ways that staff can uh, take care of themselves uh, in order to be able to take care of our students. And I think that's a, it's a, it's an important part during, you know, for this question. You know, one of the things I want to deviate maybe just slightly before we move on to the next question is just get some feedback. Because for me, one of the elephants in the room is I've not met many people that kind of say anxiety and mental health isn't important. Most people that I've talked to acknowledge that it is important. But the elephant in the room for me is about budgeting and funding, because we're continuing to see school districts, at least in the states here, budget cuts and budget reductions. We're definitely seeing folks who are not maybe front facing and student facing, such as counselors, right? Arts teachers and things like that, um, not necessarily be, be, be positioned and, and budgeted for. So what are your thoughts here between kind of the gap, at least which I perceive to be, yes, we acknowledge that mental health and well-being is important, and then actually putting the resources to hire the staff and train the staff to be able to actually, you know, kind of put your money where your mouth is. Well, um, in, in the United States, uh, as I noted earlier, there are uh, trillions of dollars that are going toward school districts and states in order to be able to provide these types of resources, unlike I've ever seen in my lifetime. Um, and and uh, it, it's certainly very, very needed. And that states, as well as the federal government, are asking very, very specific questions on how the money is being spent, what are the types of programs, uh, what are the out expected outcomes that are there. And uh, so there are strings attached in terms of the monies that are provided. And I, I frankly support that because uh, we, we need to, to be out there. But at least from the United States uh, perspective, you all ultimately hear of ESSER funds. And there's been three rounds of, of these types of uh, emergency funds that have been uh, provided uh, in the United States. Do you think it's sustainable? Uh, no, um, I, I, you know, we, we can't, uh, we won't be able to afford this uh, in, in the long term. So part of that is that uh, states as well as uh, local uh, local agencies 
uh, will have to uh, provide resources and do a, a shift. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of creativity in financing and creativity relative to looking for special grants. And there are a number of different uh, third party providers of grants, especially for, uh, for mental health and social and emotional well-being. So it really seems like a coordination plan. And I think the other thing, too, in some of the work that I've been doing is really trying to pin down. I mean, it's almost like this. It, 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 it's, it's very it's, it, it's very strange and it's very difficult, I would say, but not impossible. But thinking about how to measure SEL. Right. I think that's always been a challenge. And I think that's something that people are beginning to think about a little bit more. Uh, but before we move on to the next question, Emily, Alan, any any concluding thoughts on on, on this prompt? I think that it's something that our principals have got quite a lot of control over their own school budget and it actually comes down to priorities and and they really do have to support this and I think they recognize that and that's happening. I think the sustainability question is is in, is there but at the moment they're really still just reacting to the current crisis. All right. All right. Well, thank you for that. Let's move on to question number 4, talking a little bit about some things on the teaching side coaching, mentoring, and professional development. As a result of the pandemic, the teaching profession has been changed forever. To what extent does mentoring, coaching, and professional development play a role in helping teachers migrate through the post-pandemic learning and teaching, and teaching environment? environment? All right, Emily, I know that you do a lot of work with teacher preparation. I also know, I also know you have a video that you'd like to share. So put it up for us and tell us what we're looking at. Sure. Um, so earlier in the year, I was speaking with my, one of my colleagues in Scotland, who Alan also knows, and we our students were in lockdown and they were facing remote placements and they were really, they were experiencing some, some sort of pretty serious wellbeing challenges. It was also starting to um, become a bit of an engagement challenge, which Chris spoke about earlier. So we, we're, we need a something that we can do that um, will support their well-being, but will also give them some skills that they can take into the classroom. So what we came up with was a, a theme, which was my life in isolation, world apart or same difference. And we had our students in Melbourne, Australia, and our students in Aberdeen, Scotland, and they worked together in groups. Um, and what we asked them to do was to collect some footage from where they were and their experience of being in isolation that really represented that for them. Um, then they came together in their groups and they put their footage together and then they created some music in um, Soundtrap, which Alan was talking about earlier. Um, we've been using Soundtrap for quite a while. We really like it to use with school students because it's online, it's cloud-based, you can collaborate from anywhere around the world, but it's also got the sound Soundtrap for Education provides a safe space. So safeguarding and particularly online is really important for us as well. So that is something that we're also always very mindful of. Um, so that's particularly attractive for us and a reason why we do use it with our students and encourage them to use it with their students. Um, so they there was 80 of them and they came up with these really lovely one to two minute um, pieces of moving image and music that they created themselves. And so I think we've got a, a short one to show you now.
Wow. Thank you for sharing that video, Emily. I mean, apart from the stunning footage of people from all over the world, you know, I was really amazed as you talked about and you kind of set it up talking about using digital tools, cloud-based, collaborating with people across the world. I thought that was pretty amazing. Thoughts, reactions? Yeah, go ahead, Emily. But this, so the sort of outcomes that came from it, one of the things we asked our students, well, what did you enjoy the most? And they, the thing that came back was that, that they connected and that they made new friends. And so that was sort of really heartwarming for us. And, and there were some really terrific musical outcomes from that as well. But what really made a difference to them was that opera, opportunity for connection and collaboration with people that they didn't know. Alan, talk to us a little bit about your experience, because I know that you were kind of one half of that collaboration or involved to some degree. Well, I, um, I was working with Aberdeen University and with a lecturer, Pauline, uh, up there, and we, we, we just got in touch. And uh, Emily was already using Soundtrap in Melbourne anyway. It's basically it's a global product. Um, the bottom line is that it's a collaborative opportunity for young people. As Emily says, that's the big part in it. Young people like to work with other young people. And the fact that you can now do this in a global way, in an easy way, in a safe space way, is, is really quite exciting. Chris, are we going to see your, your students participating next year in something like this? Or maybe they already have. Actually, we are participating in it, believe it or not. And part of what we're also doing is it's not just for uh, students, but it's also for our teachers. Uh, for example, our Spanish teachers are able to use that in terms of just uh, just allowing uh, certain uh, pronunciations to, to, to be uh, shared. It, it, there, there's so many different ways, but it's an opportunity, it's a tool like many of these others uh, to extend learning any place, anytime, anywhere. And I think that's the future of education. Yeah, that's right. I think that's 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 well said. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, really warms my heart is thinking about students just from all over the world collaborating. And I think the cool thing, too, is that, you know, a lot of times when our kids used to do projects, it used to be they would just show it to their parents. Right. Or and then they can still do that. But guess what? We've now opened up a world of possibilities where they can share their work with other students, other schools other people all across the world. And I think that's a very powerful thing because the more feedback people receive and the more opportunities they have to share, I think that, that that's a good thing. Let's move on to our final question today. It's been, wow, almost an hour. We've had four really great questions, but we have one final question talking a little bit about the growth mindset. To what extent is there a mandate to maintain a growth mindset and ability to rethink and reimagine how education is delivered in the future? Growth mindset, we've heard that so much, and I know that this year has been super challenging. It's forced us to think outside the box, to create, to develop innovative solutions. To some degree, many of us are exhausted. We're in the summer, we just kind of want to take the break, but to what extent is there a mandate to continue this growth mindset and to continue looking for innovative and creative solutions for our students? Chris, let's start with you. You know, being a former Latin teacher, I'd just like to refer just very, uh, very quickly to um, the uh, Greek and Roman mythology, if you will, and uh, there's a there's a god of, uh, of known as Janus, um, and it's the god of beginnings and transitions. And I thought that was something that really talks a lot about where we currently are right now. Um, where uh, Janus presided over passages and doors, and in essence, it's represented by a two-face uh, mythology god, if you will. One uh, looking in opposite directions, number one, and number two represents the past on one hand, while the other is looking toward the future. And I think that we need to build upon the past, what we've learned in order to create the future. And part of that is not necessarily starting out with what are the questions that we want to have answered as we create that future that does not yet exist. George Bernard Stahl uh, once said, progress is impossible without change. Those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. And I think from, from this, if we're not able to have that open mindset, the ability to uh, shift and to change 
personally and professionally. Um, I, I don't. I think we're going to be uh, missing a great opportunity in creating that future that doesn't yet exist. I'd like to share just a quick, uh, quick quote from the Institute of the Future. And by the way, next week uh, is Futures Week, uh, believe it or not, uh, around the world. Um, and the Institute of Future basically says this: up to 85% of the jobs that today's graduates will have in the next 11 years have not yet been invented. And I think that says a lot about where we currently are, we need to look to the future by virtue of uh, building upon those skill sets that we've learned during this pandemic and moving forward. Uh, Soren Kirk referred to this life's journey and it said basically life can only be understood backwards, meaning looking at the history, um, because we must live life by moving forward and taking a look at the future. And I think it says a lot about where we uh, where we currently are right now. Um, and last but not least, uh, you know, I was pretty much uh, uh, touched as we take a look at the future of education, something that is evolving, that in essence, we need to take a look at a shift from preparing students uh, for the future to cultivating schools to support students to shape the future. How? Um, and it's basically by starting with the questions. And um, I, you know, this, this environment which we are currently in right now, it's an environment of disruption. It's the new normal. The pandemic is an incubator for innovation and creativity. We need to persevere, we need to have hope, and we need to pay it forward for the next generations. In essence, we're entering into Education 4.0. Education 4.0, love it. Um, Alan, Emily, any concluding thoughts here on this last prompt? Yeah. I think that, oh, go, Alan. There you go, ladies first. Oh, I was just gonna say, I think that teachers really have had a growth mindset that they can take a lot of strength from what they have achieved in the last year and a half. Um, and maybe it's about finding ways of sustaining that moving forward. But I think that they can be really proud of what they have achieved. Um, they've definitely got the capacity for that growth mindset to keep going forward into the future. And I do a lot of work with um, teachers in training and they've certainly been terrific. They've they've had some challenges, but they've been able to get through those. And now that they're coming out as graduates is I think that um, there is a lot of hope for the future. So I'm optimistic. Awesome. Yeah. Alan? Yeah, we've, we've seen positive and evolving mindsets in teachers who have never really considered online working as a methodology. So we can now decide which learning approaches we want to go back to and which we want to develop in new ways. The teachers here in the UK have reflected on learning and teaching and the progress they've made in the first lockdown in terms of reimagining how education can be delivered in the future. And of course, the well-known phrase, necessity is the mother of invention. You know, digital and online is a world we now inhabit. And I think that this means we now need to embrace all the potential benefits of technology in our teaching. Well said, well said. Well, that's all the time that we have, and this is a great way to conclude. I have really appreciated the conversation and the expertise and the collective wisdom that's been brought here today. Before we conclude, I just want to remind folks of a couple of things. The first one is about our Facebook group. It's Global Educators Network. We have a Facebook group. You can look at the bit.ly link down below. And that's just a place for us to continue the conversation, to post things. Um, if you have a question, if you have a prompt, if you're looking for some advice, if you have something to share, we invite you to be a part of that Facebook and be part of that community. And the other thing that I want to do is talk about next week's episode or our next episode of Global Take. I was privileged to facilitate today's conversation. Uh, those people who are fans of the show and, and really watch know that our usual host, Brian and Nick, our usual host, Nick, will be back next week and talking a little bit about transgender athletes in international schools, a really hot topic, a really important topic for us to talk through. Um, what are the different situations and how schools are approaching that. So we'd like to invite you to attend and participate next week. So again, I want to thank Dr. Emily Wilson, Dr. Christopher Nagy, Alan Cameron. Thank you for being part of this conversation today, contributing your experience and insight, educators from all over the world. And we hope for those of you watching that this has been something that has been stimulating for you and has caused you to do some reflection. So I want to wish everyone um, a happy summer and a restful summer as we gear up and prepare for this upcoming school year. Thanks again, everyone.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you for watching School Rubric on YouTube. Make sure that you like, follow, and subscribe in order to stay looped in on all of our diverse collection of shows, interviews, panels, tutorials, and more from educators around the globe. And visit us at schoolrubric.com for even more great content such as our online articles, Interact Magazine, featured podcasts, and more. Thank you.